Hello and welcome to Lightroom for Landscape. I'm here with Joe Cornish and we are looking at the HDR and panorama features of the latest release of Lightroom. Yeah, this is a new tool uh, and the great thing about it is I'm sure that, uh, that HDR is common currency in the landscape world and uh, has various uh, kind of overtones to it. But the fact is, it's a very, very useful technology, especially where filters, uh, for various reasons, can't help provide a solution. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're going to look at a fairly extreme example of how it can benefit the photographer. Yeah, I think HDR has got a bad reputation mainly because of the way that people use it and the way that the software has been developed for uh, HDR effects or some, some of the software like that was quite painful. Well, I think that that's right. I mean, there is a whole sort of grunge style uh, of HDR, which uh, some people do enjoy, and uh, that's their choice. Personally, I don't really like it. Mm. However, uh, there are times when uh, the, the application of differently exposed digital files and merged together can create something that's much higher quality yes. uh, than a single capture. And this is a classic example of a situation where you wouldn't stand a chance of using a grad. Uh, no, and although I didn't have a spot meter, I couldn't tell you exactly how wide that range is, Tim. I'm guessing, looking at it, it would be at least 13 or 14 stops of light. Yes. So, you know, just to make the point, we're looking, first of all, at the brightest of the four exposures, and even here, you can't see very much in the highlights. However, just to make the point, there is data in the highlights. Not very much, though. Uh, in fact, around you look the edges. At, yeah, uh, I, was, I beg your pardon, wrong way around. This is the brightest um, of the four exposures, so it's actually in the shadows uh, that we have good signal quality here. So uh, it's the last one, the darkest, which has the highlight detail. And even though that looks fairly bright there, if we pull the highlight slider back, we can see there's lots of colour data in those highlights. And we can see from the histogram how little, uh, how small an area of the picture are those highlights. Exactly. Uh, and how compressed the shadows are in that photograph. But to try to, exactly, to try to bring the shadows up out of that image, uh, which we can briefly try to do using shadow recovery and exposure, then the quality of the signal is really, really poor. The, the colour's gone, um, and if we look in closely to it, I think we're, we're not on the 100% um, at the moment, but even at 50%, we can see that it's very there's noisy. grainy, there's colour casts, yeah. uh, and we've lost resolution because of that as well. So we'll reset that one. So the beauty of, of doing the auto HDR feature is that you don't actually need to do anything beforehand. So you can literally start with your raw files in their raw state because when it reconstitutes uh, this into a single file, it's still a raw file. So it um, remarkably retains the full range from both highlights and shadows. Yeah. So from the way I understand it, it creates a, well, it creates a DNG file. Yeah. Um, and inside that DNG file, I think, is either a 16-bit or a 32-bit TIFF which has the whole dynamic range of um, all the pictures combined together. Um, just briefly, if we can look at the detail in the foreground with that um, highest exposure, we can see that how clean they are, that is in comparison. Yes, and um, even though there's some, there's some deep shadows in here, uh, the, the sort of grasses are in, in good shape here uh, and, and should look fine. So how, how much uh, aperture range or uh, how, how much did you bracket that photograph? Well, uh, I think we can probably check that if we use the information uh, tag here. I'm going to do that one more time. Uh, so there we are, two and a half seconds at f11. They're all at f11. One second. Third of a second. Third of a second. And finally, a tenth of a second at f11. And I didn't use any kind of, of camera filter. And that, that was right at the limit, but I did, I'm pretty sure I did check at the time. Yeah. Uh, asking myself, will I be able to pull back the highlights? So it's nearly two stops between each one. Yeah, one quite, a, stops quite a big range. Um, I, I can't remember now what I did at using aperture, uh, con uh, sorry, aperture priority and exposure compensation, but very likely I did. And the A7R allows you uh, three stops of exposure uh, compensation yes. beyond normal, either up, uh, over, or under. So 
that's quite a convenient automated way of doing it if you wish to do that. So we need to select all of these and if we we can actually can we do this with alt like that so we have selected them all and now what we need to do is either go control click which you've just done uh, uh, or you can take it from the top from oh, photo take it from the top as well let me go from photo and go photo, photo merge. merge so it's in the, under the photo menu and then go HDR and this creates a little preview and if you look at the while well, we're letting it boot up here uh, at the panel on the right uh, auto align is uh, defaulted to a tick position and you obviously do want that, that aligns all the files uh, if you've got the camera on a tripod there shouldn't be any problem with that at all auto tone is an option uh, it makes no difference to the file itself it just means that when you open the uh, merged HDR file up auto tone has applied uh, parameters which actually, actually make it look like a quote unquote HDR obvious image uh, and in fact we, if we click it now you can see the, the expected effect of that. So this is Lightroom's best guess at opening up the shadows and compressing the highlights and, and, Correct. and you showed me this before and it, it, it looks like it pretty much slams the shadows up to the right and the highlights down to the left to try and Pretty recover much. everything. I'll, I'll turn it off for now. Uh, the one other thing we should look at briefly is the de-ghost amount. Uh, I think that anybody who's interested in ghosting uh, can find out more about this on internet forums or indeed on Lightroom. We'll, we'll write a little tutorial. bit about this. We have a good example. This is basically yeah. if you have if you're working in a situation like this and it was windy those branches would be moving against the sun in the background uh, and if you did a normal blend you would get multiple exposures of the branches it moved around and this tries to minimize it. We'll hit merge and start this process and you'll see an activity monitor in the top left of the screen while the uh, the full HDR DNG file is being created. And these are Seni A7R files? They are. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, the HDR feature as well is that in HDR mode it remembers or it recognises the, uh, the base files even in the final DNG which has now appeared and it looks wrong doesn't it but if we now, I just want to illustrate that point so if you go to lens corrections and go to basic it still remembers or recognises the profile of the lens in use, which as it happens is the Sony 24mm f2 ZA, which is used with an adapter yes. in this case. Okay, so if we go back up to our basic module, and for the moment let's look at it without, without any local adjustments at all, so we're going to do all of this globally. Let's see what we can do if we do highlight recovery. So there's all of that highlight colour that we remember, and we'll probably just have it starting to look like it's clipping. I think there is a reason for that. We're shooting right into the sun. So, let's just see, there we are. So we're just at the kind of clipping point um, at minus 32. We'll do shadow recovery here. Whoops, that is also moving the highlights up. That's quite interesting to see. So we'll have to balance those two between one another, I guess. And I know you've got some theories about about base exposure, but before we hit that, let's just take the highlights back a little bit. So that's interesting to see that the the shadow recovery does also affect the highlights. And we'll turn these off for a second. That's, that's an extraordinarily see. good job, really, hasn't it? Well, I mean, that's a pretty useful starting point, given that we haven't done anything yet, no local adjustments. But if you think just of trying to create an image that has uh, that has presence throughout the, the shadows and the highlights. We there now have shadow and highlight detail and a minimal amount of clipping. Uh, it does look a little bit muddy in the shadows and I think we might have to work on that locally uh, to create a, more, a better dynamic range. But I think you've got something to say about exposure. Well I think that there is, um, once you have a file like this you've got so many options because, because there's so much dynamic range you can either use exposure to make it the whole file darker and then add more shadow recovery to it. Or the other uh, way around. Or the other way around. We can, we can increase the exposure, so let's put it on plus one. We don't need to use as much shadow as then, but we need to do more highlight recovery. And, mm -hmm. and each of these has slightly different characteristics, it seems. So I'm not going to say which way is better, but there is that flexibility there.
I think too that those characteristics are inherently a reflection of the subject matter and the nature of the light and the way that the tones are rendered. So I, I'm a great believer if you're going to use this tool that you experiment with it uh, quite widely and try not to limit yourself to using one control or the other but to explore the possibilities. And it's very much a matter of try to set the, the basic uh, adjustments, the global adjustments for lighting and then you can continue to refine the image using local adjustments uh, say in areas where it's particularly dark like up here. Well, I'll be interested to see if there, if there is uh, detail in those shadows there because I mean we've recovered the foreground there but that still looks very dark. It does so why don't we take the radial filter and do a quick test and we'll just use a little bit of shadow recovery as a preset here. Uh, it was everything was zeroed and we'll that's actually far too much. That's amazing, yeah, isn't it? Is. And, and really, that's only a relatively small amount. So I'm going to push it back to about sort of plus. So there's um, lots of detail just, there to just, play with. Still just plus ten, so we'll, we'll look natural, won't it? I think. Uh, and also with uh, with Lightroom's uh, brush control now in the local adjustments, it would be very easy to simply take that adjustment and use it elsewhere. We need to use full flow, I think, for that. And um, and just lift those very dark areas a little and I'm not really expecting to lift them a huge amount it might might be just a little bit more is required just to show that there's something in the shadows there yes and that would be probably enough uh, I think that's probably a little bit better overall yeah very um, impressive yeah it, it is I think I don't know about you but I, I feel that I mean, it was an amazing scene. That, that is very difficult to describe what the eye sees when you look at that. Yes. It most certainly is not like any of the single original exposures. Whether it's exactly like this image, uh, I suppose, is debatable. Um, I, I would, my memory of it is that the saturation is probably a little bit lower in the greens, at least, uh, than it appears here. Yeah. Um, but even so, the overall rendering is, is not bad at all. It might be that, so you're just taking a little bit of green out in HSL. I think if we now go back up to the uh, the base adjustments, we could probably get away with just stretching down the blacks a fraction. To compress them a little bit. Yep, and taking the whites up, which is slightly counterintuitive when we use all that hideout recovery, but that would just stretch out the file a bit, just clip for print. And actually, when you think of this image overall it's about the light penetrating the scene um, about that sort of light within and I think that you actually probably do want to clip the highlights a little bit yes. but just not too much I think too you know that is getting very close now uh, to what I would say is a relatively natural rendering we did want to just check maybe we should go to a hundred percent can we do that no problem because I think that there are uh, there's a slight issue with the way that the image renders around the edges and I think if we let's have a have a close look it's actually not too bad is it yes I think it's when when we get um, light sitting behind something very dark inevitably there's a level of flare and that's um, mm. slight lens flare uh, and you can see it on the left hand side where the whether you're also getting sensor bleed so you get very bright areas and the the pixels next to those bright areas are also receiving some of that light. I was I was wondering too if using a wide angle lens means that that's perhaps a little bit more prone to it. However, I've got to say this, is that something negative in terms of the age? Um, I don't think so. I think as long as it's, it's balanced out, um, it looks fine. Um, it certainly it lends that feeling of light penetrating the scene uh, in a way by by that, that, I mean, and also let's not forget that uh, in photographic history, uh, when lenses were much less well corrected than they are today, yes. for flare that was a, a common sight. You, you would get uh, uh, that, that kind of veiling flare, I think we call it, don't we? Yes. Uh, yeah. And and it actually can have rather a pleasing effect. I think I was concerned there might be a slight artifacting around this edge, but actually, you know what that That's is? That's sunlight. There. That's direct sunlight. Yeah. So overall. Given that we're looking at that one-to-one, -one, I think that's a pretty satisfactory result. It's interesting that the um, we've, we've processed this file a couple of times, and it does. There has been slight differences. I think the previous file, where there was a few steps 
against the tree there, and this, mm -hmm. done, this has done a better job this time. So maybe that was an alignment issue. It might might be worth if you if you are doing this and you do get problems of processing the same files again. More than but, once, yeah. But yeah. well, that's a, an excellent result, I think. Uh, we yeah. have another uh, HDR example. This one is a photograph that I took in January of this year, and it's a oh, excuse me. It's uh, in the Yorkshire Wolds, very frosty morning with the sun uh, poking its head through above some, some mist and you can see we're, we're almost black in the foreground. If I use exposure recovery to try and see what's going on in these four foregrounds, it's, it's still impressive. It is not bad. But yeah. it's, it's slightly noisy. Uh, as a matter of interest, you mentioned you shot it in January this year. Do, were you aware of the forthcoming HDR feature in Lightroom at that Not point? Not at all, no. I mean, I, I would typically, and I think I did do an exposure blend. Okay. So, because most of the highlights are in the top half of the picture, I made two layers in Photoshop. Right. Uh, and then just brushed out, brushed in the shadow detail. Let's have a quick look at your. Uh, and this is the overexposed version. Yeah. So, you can see that the highlights are pretty much gone. I mean, it's. It's incredible in these senses that you are getting some detail on the highlights. It's but not not bad, you have to say, but but even so, you can you can imagine an image like this. You want the best possible quality and in the shadows, and we can see the shadows in here are a lot more clear, the colours nicer. So let's take those two files and we'll use the right click, and we're using the same thing. It's photo merge, and go to HDR. I think it's worth saying too, isn't it, when uh, you're uh, considering HDR, the first example used four files. You here we're using two. There's no real limit, I don't think. Uh, no. uh, you know, if you want to, you can probably do one with ten. Yes. Uh, if you need to, but as a general rule, you know, two or three is actually enough. I, I think, um, from what I've heard and from what I've tried, a plus or minus two bracket with a with something like the Sony would get all the detail. Maybe a plus or minus three bracket. In the vast a, majority of in, in nearly all cases, yeah, I've I've taken the photographs for 360 panoramas before now, uh, and, and by definition, if you're taking a 360 panorama, you're going to get the sun in if it's there, yeah, and you're going to be pointing into a shadow somewhere. And I've taken on an older camera, a Sony A900, a plus or minus three bracket, uh, and I I don't change those values for the whole day, um, and it, and it works every time. So let's let's that seems to have given us some. Results. I'll find out where it's put it. It's still uh, still active. Oh, it's still processing. Look at the top left there. Yeah, it does not instantaneous because obviously it, it processes according to the size of the files. And that was a preview we had. It was. So there we are. That creates the, a new file. There's the DNG file. So let's hide that for a moment. And I got the right one selected. Still, I, no. I, I have. <laughs> yes, you I have. Yes, yes, I beg your pardon. Um, well, straight out of the bag, it's actually produced quite a nice result with a little very, bit of shadow recovery, I think. Very, yeah, very natural. And it's done a nice job. It's held held the highlights where the reflections are from the ice. Pretty well zero noise in there. Uh, and it's incredibly clean. Mm. So we'll just move the shadows right up there. Goodness, yeah. So, yeah. So you can uh, do what you want with it. And if we do the same thing at the top and set the exposure down, the sky's looking a lot more natural. Mm. So I've, I've, been, I've been very impressed. Uh, it's a feature I'll be using more often.